Hi folks, this is uh, Dr. Rob Sivis. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. And I've been, I've been doing a lot of introspection, a lot of soul searching, a lot of things have happened in my own personal life over the last little while. They're small things, but it's not about the size of the things that happen to us. It's the magnitude of how it affects us and our response to it. And I, I'm not sure where this video is going to go. I, I Normally when I do these videos, I write down a title, I have a few talking points, and I don't know where this is going to go. I know it's going to be in two or three series as we talk. Uh, James behind the camera will break that up. But really, I want to make a connection between obesity, diabetes, uh, metabolic syndrome, the use of carbohydrates as a drug, why we eat them, and really step back from that and look at triggers, triggers that get us to eat a certain way, triggers that get us to engage in dysfunctional emotion management. And as such, I'm going to really be deeply introspective myself in probably the second and the third video. So I, the, the, the title of this talk, it's going to seem a bit disparate, but I, I, I want you to understand how this goes through the, through the talk. The title of this talk is Suicide. Carbohydrates, Elon Musk, and Recovery. Suicide, Carbohydrates, Elon Musk, and Recovery. And those are all really, really, really deep topics. And I know they may seem a bit disparate, but I'm going to connect them all through my vision, through my sense. And we're going to start today's video um, about a letter that I received from a patient of mine. And um, this is a lady who is very structured in life, very authoritarian, very kind soul. And one of the things that we talked about is her ability to be able to process and deal with the things that are causing stress and anguish in her life instead of just turning to sugar and starch as a drug to numb, soothe, and obliterate her emotional needs. How do we recover from this? When we give up those carbohydrates, how do we replace their role in our lives with other things? And this letter comes from earlier this month, and it says, Dear Dr. Sivers, this letter comes to you as a fulfillment of a promise I made to you and to myself. At my last appointment, we discussed a past where you referred to written letters as a form of action-based addiction treatment. Action-based, effort-based, emotion management and addiction treatment. So here I am, coffee, <laughs> coffee, bridge in hand, because a bridge is something we use for that little mind cleansing moment, bridge in hand, writing my first ever pen pal letter. I guess technically it's a pen letter since I don't expect a response from you. Well, this is my response. I'm not sure where this content is going, she says. If it's a brain dump, it will be short. If, if it arrives, you'll know it's more therapeutic. In other words, as she's writing this, she's not even sure she's going to send it. It's also a challenge to my small muscle coordination. So she's getting some physical activity and creative art, aside from the emotion management, from writing down her thoughts. And that's really the purpose of an effort-based emotion management system. She goes on. There is one point I've always wanted to address with you. While it doesn't merit FaceTime, I've thought about it several times. In my initial appointment, you asked, appointment, you asked about my husband. He had just died recently of organ failure after using Genuvia for his diabetes. I described him as being stubborn and unwilling to change, even though... I was being successful. So here's his wife successfully changing her way of life. And a husband with type 2 diabetes obstinately deciding that he's unwilling to change. You said I, I was mad at him for dying. Think about that, folks. You said that I was mad at him for dying. And she's corrected me. She says, I think I was mad at him for not living his best life. I think I was mad at him for not trying. 
He so enjoyed being the victim. He refused to see that he could not control, that he refused to see that he could control his diabetes. In his mind, he was doomed, so why not live for the day and adjust the insulin dose to counteract the carbs to where the cause of the diabetes in the first place? So I'm thankful that his slow spiral of death didn't last any longer than it did. Think of that, folks. Think of that. If you have diabetes, if you have obesity, if you have metabolic syndrome, think of what it's doing to the people around you. I am thankful that his slow spiral of death didn't last any longer than it did. I'm slowly fighting my way out of the woods of addiction myself. It's hard to put myself out there, and opening up is painful. Being vulnerable is so uncomfortable, but it brings such freedom at the same time. It also brings expanding opportunities. Once my husband died, I decided to get back to playing golf after about 10 years of caring for my husband exclusively, sacrificing myself to take care of a person who was busy dying because they didn't want to take care of themselves. Think of that, folks. Basically, her husband was slowly and intentionally committing suicide by carbohydrate consumption. At my first golf lesson, I met two women who are in the same situation as myself. One introduced, uh, one introduced me to a group of friends at the gym. The other invited me to play in her mahjong group. The three of us have a standing golf date, activity-based self-care at work. Think about that. Activity-based self-care at work. She has taken our message. She has taken our model of carb addiction and is doing her level best in recovery. I am so deeply appreciative of your care and concern, she says to me. Please keep fighting the good fight and calling bullshit on the status quo. The diet, the calories in, calories out, exercise more model. You are making a big difference in my life and in turn the lives of my grandsons with whom I am now more com connected because of empathy. You are a good man. Looking forward to my next appointment. Sincerely, not going to say who she is. Folks, that letter is an incredible letter that just describes what we do in our practice. You see, I can't go out there and help people who are engaged in carbohydrate addiction and a very self-destructive behavior for emotion management. I call it slow suicide. It's obvious when you think of alcoholism or heroin addiction uh, uh, or smoking. Everybody consider those to, those to be suicidal relationships. But we don't think of our relationships of carbohydrates to be slowly suicidal. But what it's really doing is taking all the other options off the table. All the other options off the table. When we have a relationship with a drug that we're using for numbing, soothing, and obliterating of our emotional tension, all the others go out the window. We're not able to be vulnerable. We're not able to connect effectively with other people. There's no need to find other resources. And the negative impact that has on our sense of self, our self-esteem, our self-confidence, our self-respect, it just drives that deep into the toilet. And then why do we care? Why do we care anymore? When we go on those binges of three days of just pigging out on carbohydrates, and then we have all this remorse and regret. And our doctors give us insulin that we can shoot up with to bring our blood sugar down. Folks, that letter for me is a very, very powerful letter. On one hand, describing the inevitable suicide by carbohydrates of this woman's husband who chose, despite the knowledge, not to change. And then on top of that, she herself made the decision to change. It's tough. It's hard. It's difficult being vulnerable. Mostly it's difficult being vulnerable to yourself. But once you turn that corner, once you start exposing yourself a little bit, taking that risk of being vulnerable, the magnitude of that transformation is enormous. Reconciling with family 
finding new friends, where the friendship is built on empathy and vulnerability, not on how good you are and admire me. You notice we haven't once talked about food. We haven't once talked about exercise. We haven't once talked about calories. That's not why you're fat. That's not why you have diabetes. Addiction is a miserable state of being that robs you of who you are as a human being, and it is slow suicide. I know this is deep. I know it's harsh. I know most of you say, oh, no, it's not. Every day, every day, more Americans die of carbohydrate toxicity than anything else. Challenge me on that. More heart attacks, more strokes, more cancer, more blood clots, DVTs, more deaths from COVID, which are metabolically foundationed. And yet, you know, folks, I myself, I myself am a victim of this. And while, while today's video, and again, I didn't know how it was going to go, but today's video was about that letter, about that person, because it was such a, a, an example of such clarity of two people. One is trying to live, the other one tried to die and eventually did. Husband and wife. In the next video, I'm going to tell my story just a little bit. So if, if you want to look over my fence... And, and see a little bit more about me, I'll open up. I am the carb addiction doc. I'm also a carb addict.